هذا القرآن يوحدنا لطريق الخير يوجبنا الله تعالى أنزله ورسول الله معلمنا ورسول الله معلمنا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته what surah are we supposed to be doing today? Al-Fajr. We're doing surah to, we're supposed to be doing surah al-fajr, but I was reminded yesterday by a brother that uh, we actually lost our recording for surah al-kafirun. So we had recorded surah al-kafirun many many months back, but that recording was lost. And I was thinking about that for a long time, and then it dawned upon me that today is September 11th, you know, the 12th anniversary of uh, the events that happened in New York City. So I thought, let's see if we can take this as a reminder for ourselves in understanding the true purpose behind Surah Al-Kafirun. Besides understanding the true purpose of Surah Al-Kafirun. So for those of you that are following along, we will be doing Surah Al-Kafirun today, bi Ta'ala. And understanding Surah Al-Kafirun, it's very important to understand the Surah that came before it. And before actually getting to the Surah that, before, that came before it, I actually want to share my 9-11 story with you. And I'm sure everyone has a story of 9-11, where they were, what they were doing. Do you have a story? Do you remember what you were doing on 9-11? Yeah, I was at school. You were at school? Similarly with me, I was at school, I was in Medina. I had been in Medina for about a week and a half now. And I'm trying to call my parents and I, I couldn't get through. No matter how much I tried, you know, it's like your call cannot be connected, your call cannot be connected. So I started asking some of the other brothers from North America. I'm like, look, I'm trying to call home. My call isn't going through. And they're like, don't you know what's happening? And I'm like, no, what's happening? They're like, two planes just went into the World uh, Trade Center buildings. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And they're like, no, that's honestly what happened, you know? So the only source of, you know, information at that time was two. One was the internet and one was the TV. Now the internet, let me describe it to you. We used to pay 20 reals an hour, which is roughly around, at that time it was like more than 10, around $10, around $10. And they had 56.6 kilobytes per second. And that, that wasn't bad enough in itself. It was divided amongst like 12 people. So back then we had Hotmail. You're trying to open one email, literally it's taking 45 minutes long. So just reading the news would have been impossible. So our second form of news was McDonald's. McDonald's was the only place in Medina that had a public TV. You could not get a public TV anywhere else in Medina. So we went to McDonald's and we started watching CNN. And CNN is showing what's happening. And I'm like, la ilaha illallah. You know, what is this going to mean for Muslims in North America at that time? This was before they had any, you know, security measures in place. This is before, you know, Muslims went through any form of major Islamophobia or xenophobia or anything like that. This is before all of those days happened. And one could only fear, you know, the worst at that time. So a couple of days went by. I wasn't able to contact my family. No emails, no phone. You know, I didn't know what was happening in North America at that time. I just had to focus on my studies and make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that everything was okay. And that was my personal 9-11 story. But as time went on, you know, things became a lot much more difficult for myself, for my family and Muslims in general in North America. I remember, you know, just going through the airport. Um, the University of Medina used to book our flights every year and they used to try to book our flights as much as possible on Saudi Arabian Airlines. So traveling to Montreal, the closest Saudi Arabian airline port at that time was New York City. So pro, imagine, you know, the year after, uh, not even a year, like 10 months after 9-11 happens, I have to fly through New York City. And I wasn't prepared for that. I didn't have any Western clothes and getting Western clothes in my size in Medina wasn't an easy task. <laughs> so, you know, I mustered together what I could. I had, uh, you know, I had my parents send me a, a pair of track pants and a t-shirt and eventually, I can't remember what happened, but even the t-shirt, it was like too small or something. So I'm like, I have nothing to wear on the top. I was like, let me just put my trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I'm going to wear a thobe. So I wore a thobe into New York City, from flying from Jeddah, and I'm just making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, let everything be okay. 
And it was a, a major learning experience in the sense that when I landed in JFK, I went through immigration, it was as easy as possible could be. Like I've never witnessed something so easy. And even people in the line, they're like, are you crazy? Are you gonna cross immigration dressed like that? And I'm like, dude, I don't have any other clothes. You know, what do you want me to do? It's either this or I go shirtless. So I go through immigration, everything was perfectly fine. And I'm like, man, maybe things aren't as bad as I thought they would be. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught me a very important lesson. As I'm leaving JFK airport at that time, I needed to switch to LaGuardia airport to catch my flight. And as I'm switching and I'm crossing the road, the band of my watch, it got stuck on the uh, bar of my suitcase and my, wa my watch slipped off. So it tore apart, it slipped off and it went a little bit in the air and it came crashing on the ground. And that literal two seconds, it felt like it was 30 seconds. Because the second it snapped off my wrist and people saw something flying into the air, all eyes are on me. And then as the watch is going down to the ground, you can see people's hands going like this. And eventually it hits the ground and someone shouts, take cover! And you see people start panicking. And literally, you know, there's like a garbage can, a person took shelter behind a garbage can because my watch had you know, fallen on the floor on the middle of a street just outside the airport. And I thought, SubhanAllah, this is the reality of fear that this act has placed inside. Then we all hear multiple stories of you know, mosques being attempted to be burned down, you know, racist attacks that were taking place. I remember a personal incident. My wife and I were at a grocery store. She's uh, wearing niqab at the time and she dropped something on, on, this, uh, on the side of the car. And as she went to pick, up, pick it up, another car was just leaving as well. She gets up with niqab and the woman that was there, she starts swearing in French. Like she just, I, I can't even remember what she was saying, but she's like, you know, get out of this country. And I'm like, dude, I was born in this city, you know. I don't get more Canadian than that. I was born in this very city in Montreal. And then time after time, you know, we keep hearing these things. Even coming up next week, you know, in Toronto, they're having two people coming down, uh, Pamela Geller and David Spencer. These are like the two biggest Islamophobes of our times. And they're being invited into Canada to speak. And why do such people exist? Why are they being given a platform? Because such events as 9-11 happened. Now you can put all you know, conspiracy theories aside. Was it Muslims that did it? Was it you know, organized by the government themselves? That's not our focus of discussion. Our focus of discussion is going to be the reality that close to 3,000 people died that day. And that is a big atrocity. From them were Muslims. From them you know, were citizens of the United States of America, our very neighbors. Now, tying this in, what was our responsibility? I remember speaking to Dr. Bilal Phillips after 9-11 and I'm like, you know, what is one thing that you wish you had done before 9-11 took place? And his answer was that I wish I had given the people more da'wah, that I, they had a better understanding of what Islam was, that Islam had a better picture painted for itself, you know, through me, so that the Muslims wouldn't go through these atrocities. And that's what I want to focus our discussion on, that Surah Al-Kafirun even though it concludes by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying to you is your religion and to us is our religion. The focus of the surah is defining the 13 years that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa was amongst the Quraysh. As those 13 years were spent giving da'wah and after they refused for 13 years, that is when the surah is revealed to Allah's Messenger and that is when he makes hijrah. That look, you, after 13 years I've done my utmost best. If you're not going to accept Islam now, then you know I need to move on and do other things. And that is when the hijrah took place. So it is a reflection of da'wah at that time. So now, getting back to Surah Al-Kawthar. The relationship between Surah Al-Kawthar and Surah Al-Kafirun. You'll notice that Surah Al-Kawthar is the Surah just before Surah Al-Kafirun. And you find you know, a couple of relevant points inside Surah Al-Kawthar that are alluded to inside Surah Al-Kafirun. So inside Surah Al-Kawthar, they insult the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Who remembers what the insult was that they insulted the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with? Excellent. They died. Excellent. So they insulted the Prophet ﷺ by saying that you will not be remembered because your lineage is cut <coughs> off because you have no voice to continue your lineage. And this was the insult that they gave them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defended the Messenger of Allah ﷺ through this surah. Now after they called the Messenger of Allah ﷺ this name, even though the two surahs weren't revealed after another, the placement of the surahs is what is of significance. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they called him cut off, they called him abtar, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls them as a result calling them kafir. 
So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala retaliates on behalf of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by calling them kafir. The second thing you realize over here is that in terms of the attack of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they couldn't attack his character and they couldn't attack his actions. Right? They couldn't say anything bad about his character. They couldn't say anything bad about his actions. So what do they result towards? They start resulting towards things that he didn't have any control over. That he would have no male children. This is what they, get this is what they attacked him for. Whereas the Messenger of Allah وسلم, now that he is commanded to call them kuffar, he is commanded to call them kafir, this is something that they're actually guilty of. This is something that they actually have control over. So this is the second point of significance. This is the second point of significance. The third point of significance is that when you look at the reason of revelation, does anyone know why Surah Al-Kafirun was revealed? Why did Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala reveal Surah Al-Kafirun? Let's give someone else a turn, inshaAllah. It's a very famous incident in the seerah. It is not like uh, the Mushri came here to uh, give some Invitation, like if you, no, like you're right, you're right. Continue. You will do our religion, and we will do your religion, like by turn. Fantastic. So they came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and this is the said reason of uh, revelation. They came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they said, "Look, you worship our religion for one year." And we will worship your religion for one year. And this will be the agreement be amongst us. And this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to in the Quran when he says, What do law tudhinu fayudhinun? That they want you to compromise in your faith so that they will compromise in their faith. So that they will compromise in their faith. Now, what are this the compromise that they're making with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? It is of two things, right? Number one is of a worldly purpose. They said, we will give you all the women you want, we will give you all the gold and silver you want, we will give you the biggest of palaces and mansions, and we'll give you all of the servants. So this is from the dunya perspective. These are all of the things that they're offering him in order for him to leave his faith. Now the relationship beside, with this and Surah Al-Kawthar is that if you look at the very beginning, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Inna a'tayna kal kawthar. That you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we have given you an abundance of things. Now this ultimate abundance is in the hereafter, right? And in this dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a lot as well. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically, he came to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before the Quraysh could bribe him. So the Quraysh had no ability to bribe him because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had promised him everything he would ever need. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had promised him everything he would ever need. So he was unable to be bribed. Now the second element is that if you look at the state of the Muslims, if you look at the state of the Muslims at that time, they are weak, they do not have much wealth, they are very poor, they are very few in number, meaning that they, do, they don't have strength. So why is it that the stronger body is coming to make an agreement with the weaker body. Why would the stronger Quraysh come to make an agreement with the weaker Muslim minority? Who can answer that question? It is not like that the day by day people are attracted by Muslims and Muslims. Yeah, but still it wasn't a lot. It wasn't like, you know, tens or hundreds of people. You're getting like maybe one person every couple of weeks. That's what was happening. Why is the stronger Quraysh trying to make an agreement with the weaker Muslim minority? Go ahead. Because they know. Fantastic. Is that true strength is not measured in wealth, it is not measured in numbers, it is measured on the side of the truth, right? And the Quraysh knew that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was coming with the truth. So sooner or later they were bound to be overcome. Sooner or later they were bound to be overcome. So if they did not, you know, try to pursue an agreement right now, they knew they were eventually going to lose their way of life, lose their faith, lose their religion altogether. Lose their religion altogether. And then you see this again being tied in to the end of Surah Al-Kawthar when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna shaniyaka huwa al-abtar. That the one that opposes you, they are the ones that will be forgotten. So you look at the heads of the Quraysh, unless you've taken a detailed course on the seerah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you don't know who Umayyah you know, bin Khalaf was. You don't know who Al-Walid ibn Mughira was. You don't know who the heads of the Quraysh was. So in reality, they are the ones that were forgotten and that is why they were trying to pursue this deal because they wanted their way of life to continue. But Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala told them at, this end, at the end of Surah Al-Kawthar that the ones who oppose you, O Messenger of Allah, they are the ones that are going to be cut off. They are the ones that are going to be cut off. So now let us actually move in to the virtues of Surah Al-Kafirun. When did the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recite the Surah? There are many, many instances, particularly the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to recite Surah Al-Kafirun. Who remembers them? Go ahead. 
studying uh, very uh, studied the Salah. Fantastic. Then, uh, sunnahs of of Fajr. Then Maghrib Sunnah. The Sunnahs of Maghrib. Fantastic. And, uh, with the Witr. With the Witr. The second Raka'ah of the Witr. Okay. Fantastic. Can you think of any more? Anyone else who can help him out? There's one particular one that I'm thinking of that is not relevant to everyone at all given times. Oh, fantastic. The two rak'ahs that you pray in tawaf. So the Messenger of Allah وسلم, used to recite these surahs very, very frequently. What's important to note over here, the last prayer of the night and the first prayer of the day. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, is reciting the same two surahs. Qul ya kafirun and qul huwa Allahu ahad. Both in the witr prayer and both in the sunnahs of fajr. Now Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he comments on this combination. There's actually the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam where he says, what a blessed pair Suratul Kafirun and Suratul Ikhlas are. So if you look at these two surahs, what is like a reoccurring theme in them is that in Suratul Ikhlas, this fortifies our foundation in terms of our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His oneness. And then Suratul Kafirun, it addresses the practical aspect. So the, Al-Ikhlas is theological, it is uh, internal, it is a faith-based matter of the heart, whereas Al-Kafirun is an action-based matter, meaning that our actions are going to be different from those who disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. And then in terms of another virtue, it is narrated that Surah Al-Kafirun, like Surah Al-Ikhlas, was given a special portion of the Qur'an. So Surah Al-Ikhlas, it is said that it is equivalent to one-third of the Qur'an. And about Surah Al-Kafirun, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it is equivalent to one quarter of the Qur'an. One third and one quarter. So if you recite both of them together, Ayyub, how much of the Qur'an have you recited? Five, one, eighths. five eighths. Is he correct? Let's figure this out. Seven twelfths? Come on, man, you guys can't confuse me like this. Which one is it? <laughs> seven twelfths? Yeah, seven twelfths is right. One quarter is three. Yeah, seven twelfths is correct. So you get seven twelfths of the Qur'an you know, being recited in the sunnahs of Fajr, which is like the shortest prayer you should be praying in your day. The sunnahs of Fajr. So that you've taken uh, you know, that portion of the Qur'an. So now starting off with the surah itself. Starting off with the surah itself. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam directly by saying, You, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, go and give them this message. Meaning that this message is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. Now the significance of this message over here is that two things are happening. One, that this message is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not from the message, Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Two, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to specifically command the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to address the people of Quraysh like this because it was not from the habits of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be so stern. That even if you look throughout the seerah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after everything that happened, how many instances do you find that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam refers to someone as a kafir? Right? You will not find many, many instances at all where the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam specifically will refer to someone as a kafir. Because it just wasn't a part of the nature of the Messenger of Allah. Very soft, very easy going, very laxed. So to call someone a kafir was an extremely big deal. So here Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is commanding the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to do this because of his soft nature. And number two, because this message is coming from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and not from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A second thing to look at is that why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not address the kuffar directly? So you'll notice in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. And He says, Ya ahl al-kitab. But why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not say, Ya ayyuhal kafirun? Go ahead. To show His displeasure and to show the distance. That with the ahl al-kitab, from them were still people that you were following their faith. They had goodness in them. They had righteousness in them. But now that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to them as kafir, this means there is no goodness in them whatsoever. And this is something relevant that when we come to discuss that is this surah revealed towards every disbeliever or is this referring to a specific group of disbelievers? And the answer to that in summary is that here this surah is specifically referring to the Quraysh, uh, the heads of the Quraysh in specific. And certain elements of it can be taken to mean general. Certain elements of it can be taken to mean general. So here's a, a pop question now. Is that did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ever address the kuffar directly in the Quran? I think we only have one half of the Quran here. But someone else might know this. Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ever address the kuffar directly in the Quran? I was able to find one place. 
Ahsant in Surah Al-Tahreem. So here, I wish I had something to give you, man. That deserves a price. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does address the kuffar directly in one instance. And that is in Surah Al-Tahreem, in verse number 7. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says that, O you who have disbelieved, do not make excuses. And this is for the Day of Judgment, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will address them. So in this dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not address them directly. And there's no direct message for the kuffar directly in the Quran. But rather all messages are conveyed through the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because of his displeasure with the disbelievers, specifically those ones. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He calls them kafir. He says, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُ Actually, there's a bit in the middle, ayyuha. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use ayyuha? Ayyuha is used in the Arabic language to show formality, right? You, when you're speaking to a child, you don't say, يَا أَيُّهَا الْوَلَدْ You just say, يَا وَلَدْ And you call the child to come here. But when you're being formal, you will say, يَا أَيُّهَا nabi Or, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ Right? It's an act of formality. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this act of formality to show the seriousness of the message. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't playing around, there's no jokes, there's no games, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being very serious. So the first indication of this is in the formality of ayyuha. Then the second indication of this is kafirun, is kafirun. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the noun to show kufr, no, uses the noun to show kufr. What is the significance between a noun and a verb? Go ahead. The noun is permanent. So it has no relationship with time and place. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing that the ones that are being addressed in this surah, that their state is not changing. That after 13 years of da'wah, the Messenger of Allah has tried being soft with them, tried being logical with them, has provided for them you know, the best logical arguments you can come with and the best akhlaq that you can ever have. And even then they have not changed. So this is a permanent state that they are going to be in, meaning it has no relationship with time or no relationship with place. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically foretelling that the heads of the Quraysh, that there's no hope for them, that look, they're going to die in this state. And this is what you see eventually, a lot of them end up dying in Badr and in Uhud and you know, in, in, in other battles as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the noun instead of the verb. So now what does the term kufr actually mean? What does the term kufr actually mean? The term kufr means to cover something up. So when someone denies something, this is called kufran and ni'ma. Kufran and ni'ma means to deny a blessing that has been given to you because it's being covered up, it's being concealed, it's being denied. So that is the linguistic meaning of it, to cover something up. Now the shari'i meaning of this, the shari'i meaning of this, it has a relationship with two other terms. So you'll find in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use three terms that are almost synonymous with some variations. So in terms of disbelief, so what we're looking at is faith and disbelief. If you were to look at faith, you have Iman, you have Islam, you have Ihsan, and you have other levels in between. Then when you look at disbelief, you also have three things, right? You have Kufr, you have Shirk, and you have Nifaq. Kufr, Shirk, and Nifaq. The most general of all of these is Kufr. And shirk and nifaq will actually be branches of kufr. Shirk and kufr, sorry, shirk and nifaq are actually branches of kufr. So if you wanted to draw a Venn diagram, for those of you that have paper, a Venn diagram would look, you would draw a big circle, that would be kufr one of itself. And then inside of this big circle, you have two smaller circles, which are nifaq and shirk. And then what this Venn diagram indicates is that every mushrik is a kafir, and every munafiq is a kafir, but not every kafir is necessarily a mushrik, nor is every kafir necessarily a munafiq. And this draws the relationship between these three uh, elements or these three categories of disbelief. So now in understanding this term, go ahead. So in the big circle is kufr. Yeah, big circle is kufr. The smallest one is even the nifaq? No, the, the two small ones, not, they're both small, are shirk and nifaq. And when yeah, they are disbelievers. So that's what I was trying to tell you, that every mushrik is a kafir. Every munafiq is a kafir. But not every kafir is a mushrik, nor is every kafir a munafiq. So do you understand the relationship? We need like the equals and not equals to signs over here. What's, uh, I don't know if you're going to get to that. What's the difference between a mushrik? Yeah, we're going to get to that inshallah shortly. We're going to get into that shortly. Okay, so does everyone understand the relationship now? So now let's go into actually explaining these terms. Let us go into explaining these terms. Starting out with nifaq. Starting out with nifaq. Nifaq is of two types. The type we're discussing tonight is that which is major nifaq. 
Minor nifaq, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa says, has four attributes. These four attributes, if a person has them, it doesn't take him outside the fold of Islam. It just means he's on the verge of losing his Islam. His Islam is very, very weak. And he discusses this in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, that the attributes of a munafiq are four. When he speaks, he lies. When he speaks, he lies. Number two, when he makes a promise, he breaks that promise. When he makes a promise, he breaks that promise. Number three, when he's trusted with something, he breaches the trust. So you tell him a secret, he will not keep He's going to go on Facebook and Twitter and you know, announce it to the world. That's what the monafic will do. And then the fourth thing is that when he gets into an argument, he loses his temper and he becomes very foul and obscene. That when he gets into an argument or a dispute, he'll become very vile and obscene. So these are the four attributes of minor nifaq. These are the four attributes of minor nifaq. And then major nifaq is an individual that <laughs> professes Islam openly, but on the inside he is hiding the utmost hatred for Islam. On the inside he is hiding the utmost hatred for Islam. Who remembers who the leader of the hypocrites in Medina was? Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul was the leader of the hypocrites. That their only purpose there was that they professed Islam so that they could be politically and financially protected. But what they wanted to do was from the inside, they wanted to destroy Islam. And this is what major nifaq is. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran specifically gives them the most severest punishment. That the hypocrites will be in the lowest depths of the hellfire. This applies to major hypocrisy and not minor hypocrisy. This applies to major hypocrisy and not minor hypocrisy. Then number two, we have the term mushrik. We have the term mushrik. The term mushrik in summary is someone who gives a right which is exclusive to Allah to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A mushrik is someone that gives a right which is exclusive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that by definition what a mushrik is. Then the kafir is someone that completely denies. Someone that completely denies. But denies what? over here. Does he deny the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No, that is not the case. Because you'll notice in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the, the Quraysh that if you were to ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they would say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the heavens and the earth. So what exactly are they denying? They are the deniers of the truth. So an individual that has been given a message and they deny this message after all sorts of proofs have been given to them, this is what the term kafir actually means. This is what the term actually kafir actually means. Now, an important point to understand over here is that sometimes these terms will be used synonymously. So a mushrik will be used in order to mean kafir. And this is what we see in Surah An-Nisa. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bih, wa yaghfiru ma duna thalika li yasha. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive that anyone should commit shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but He forgives anything other than that. He forgives anything other than that to whom He pleases. So here the term mushrik is being used as a synonym for the term kafir. That is one way of looking at it. That is one way of looking at it. Go ahead. Is that why... Well, the word, that's what I was just getting to right now. That's what I was getting to right now. There's another opinion on this matter, and that is that every kafir in reality is a mushrik. Every kafir in reality is a mushrik. Now, what does this statement actually mean? How does every kafir actually become a mushrik? You want to answer that? Go for it. Um, because if they're denying Allah, Ahsant, Ahsant. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al Jathiyah, verse number 23, He says, Have you seen the one who takes his desires as his Lord? So this minority group, they said that Islam does not even recognize atheism. This concept of not having a God, Islam does not accept it. Because either you're worshipping something that you know you can see or is tangible or has proofs to it, or you're worshipping your own desires and your own ego. But in reality, to worship nothing is not possible. You're always going to be worshipping something. And that comes into the second verse when we actually talk about what exactly does worship mean? What exactly does worship mean? So there's a minority group of scholars that said that in fact every, uh, every kafir is in reality a mushrik, but this is a minority opinion. This is a minority opinion. 
So that makes it clear what a kafir is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to. Now we move on to verse number two, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, La a'budu ma ta'budun. That I will not worship that which you worship. So you'll notice now, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gone from the noun, which is the, the kafir, he's now, now gone into a verb structure. He's now gone into a verb structure. That I will not worship that which you worship. I will not worship that which you worship. Now the reason why this is taking place, why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using a verb now? Because if you look at the offer of the Quraysh, the Quraysh were, look, you worship our God this year, or you worship our faith this year, and we will worship your faith next year. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now He starts using the verb to indicate that time. That look, I'm not going to worship your God now, nor will I worship Him in the future. And same thing with you, that whether you want to you know, take a year on and off, this is not going to be accepted from you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands that you have to enter into Islam wholeheartedly, completely, without any exceptions. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes from the noun to the structure of the verb. The integral part of this verse is understanding what the concept of ibadah means over here. What the concept of ibadah means over here. The general definition that is given is that of uh, Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. When he says that ibadah is ismun jami' li kulli ma yuhibbuhu Allah wa yardahu min al aqwal wal afal al zahirat wal batina. That it is a comprehensive term that encompasses every single good deed from statements and actions, that which are hidden or that which are made apparent. So it is a comprehensive term that encompasses every single good deed, that which is um, done in apparent or that which is done, whether it be from statement or from action. So this is the general term. But if you actually look inside his book called al ubudiyah this is a book that he's written on being a worshiper, a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are actually five things that he mentions in order for a person to become a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I believe these five conditions are actually more practical for our discussion than the definition itself. He says in order for a person to truly become a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, five things need to take place. Number one, the individual needs to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unconditionally. The slave of Allah needs to have unconditional obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, is that the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala above all else in this world. The slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala above all else in this world. The third one is a bit tricky. The Arabic of it is actually a bit tricky because it is a combination of fear and its results. So he talks about how the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than anything in this world and as a result of that fear, as a result of that fear, he should be the most humble and have the most humility towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is a combination of fear and humility towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those are the first three. Who can repeat what they are? What are the first three I just mentioned? Go ahead. Unconditional obedience uh, to Allah. Yeah. He has to love Allah more than anything and everything. Yeah. And he needs to fear Allah more than anything. Humble and have humility. Excellent. Then the last two he mentions, the last two he mentions are the utmost sincerity, the utmost sincerity for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that everything he does in his life, the truest slave of Allah is the one that will purely live his life for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So he will have the utmost amount of sincerity. And then the point number five is that all of this is done in accordance to the teaching of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That all of this is done in accordance to the teachings of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you'll notice that with the Quraysh, they had a combination of some of these elements. In terms of obedience, they would obey Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala at certain times. In terms of love, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says that they used to love Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala but not as much as they loved their idols. And the people who have faith love Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala even more, right? In terms of fear of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, they did have fear of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala when they were in trouble. When the punishments were coming, they would fear Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. In terms of sincerity, they would only have sincerity in times of distress. But in times of prosperity, there was no sincerity. There was no sincerity. But in terms of following the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is where they all fell short. They could not accept the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a messenger even though they knew it was true. 
They used to say things like, couldn't Allah have sent angels? Couldn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have found an individual better than you to send us as a prophet? These are the sort of things they would say and they would never ever follow his example. So this is what Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah mentions that this is what the true slave will be like. So for our discussion, that's what we want to talk about. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, tell them I will not worship what you worship, it is these five things. That the Quraysh would never have unconditional love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quraysh would never have unconditional obedience. But they would pick and choose what they want. They would pick and choose what they want. And this is what it ultimately comes down to. That if you look at why was the lifestyle of Islam so different from the lifestyle of the Quraysh, it comes down to sources of morality. Right? The source of morality for the Muslims was the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is divinely guiding the Muslims and directing the Muslims. Whereas the source of morality for the Quraysh, where did it come from? It just came from their own desires. What they thought was good today could become bad tomorrow. And what they thought bad today could become good tomorrow. So there was no, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Consistency. No consistency. Whereas for the Muslims, you'll notice that the lifestyle of the Muslim will be consistent. We will always consider alcohol haram. We will always consider riba haram. We will always consider zina haram. We will always consider, you know, con uh, covering up our women to be a good thing. Whereas when you look at a lifestyle and a model that does not have this divine guidance and, you know, um, direction, you look what happens over time. That you take a place like Montreal, you know, in the 1940s, a woman shows her ankles and she's considered indecent and inappropriate. Where in, this, in our day and age, this is like a funny article uh, written in like 2010, why prostitution was going out of business. They said that the women were dressed so, you know, in a, in a terrible way that they could no longer distinguish a prostitute from an average girl. So they had to change their marketing style. And I remember reading this, I was like, SubhanAllah, you know, this is what happens when there's no divine direction and guidance. Your own morality is whatever your heart desires and your heart without protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, without the remembrance of Allah, will always go towards corruption. Will always go towards corruption unless it is protected from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the key distinction over here that is being made. That if you're not worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the lifestyle will automatically become completely different. And the biggest difference in the lifestyle is who we worship. Where we will worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everyone else will resort to either things they created themselves or they will worship their own egos or they will worship their desires. That, no one, that there is no you know, other way, right? So that is the distinction that is being made. So then in the third verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He goes on to say, وَلَا أَنْتُمْ أَعْبِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ Nor will you worship that which I worship. Now this is a significant verse over here for two reasons. Because here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that even if you were to do this agreement of you know, one year on, one year off with Islam, that wouldn't be accepted from you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is denying that completely be accepted from you. Because in order to be Muslim, you have to be a full-time Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us, وَدْخُلُوا فِي السِّلْمِ kafa That enter into Islam wholeheartedly and completely. And that the only religion that will be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Islam. إِنَّ الدِّينَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ الْإِسْلَامِ وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِ غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْهُ That whoever seeks a religion other than Islam, then this will never be accepted from him. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that you can't pick and choose from Islam what you want. You cannot say that I will be you know, a Muslim today and the next season, you know, I'm not going to be Muslim. It doesn't work like that. You have to accept Islam completely. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on in the fourth verse, and I shall not worship that which you are worshipping. And I shall not worship that which you are worshipping. And this is the second rejection. That you know, this whole year on and off thing, it's not going to work. And this is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only rejects it in the present, the first time, but now He's rejecting it in the future as well. That the, in this future, there's no way I will ever worship that which you worship. It's never going to happen, so you need to give up on it. You need to give up on it. And then in the last verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concludes the surah by saying, لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَلِيَدِينَ That for you is your way of life, and for me is my way of life. And this is like the defining barrier that this is after this point, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam makes his hijrah towards Medina and that relationship with Mecca has now officially been cut off. That relationship with Mecca has now officially been cut off and he will not enter Mecca again up until the Fatah of Mecca happens. Up until the Fatah of Mecca happens. 
Now this is what I want to get into, the concept of the rules of engagement. The concept of the rules of engagement. In terms of the rules of engagement between us and disbelievers, what are the rules of engagement? Like what is our relationship meant to be with the disbelievers? Our relationship with the disbelievers is meant to be one of da'wah. That is the foundation of our relationship with all other religions. That we are here to call them towards Islam. When uh, Rubi ibn Amr, he was sent to the ruler of the Byzantine, if I'm not mistaken, he asks him, you know, the, uh, the emperor asks him, what is this message that you've come to me with? He says, we've come to extract the people from the worship of the creation to the worship of the creator. And this is our relationship, that as a Muslim, our rules of engagement are with all of the things that we do to give the people da'wah. The most important aspects of da'wah is through our character. Because this is what is actually going to impress the people or have a soft space in their heart for us. So the most important form of da'wah is through one's character. And once a person has reached this level where they have good character, then the person moves on to the da'wah through their tongue. Because you've seen this so many times that someone who is harsh and has bad morals and bad character, they give da'wah to people and actually repels the people away no matter how logical or how well presented that da'wah may actually be. So a person has to have good character in giving that da'wah. And then number two, what he's actually saying has to be true. And it's only when these two things are combined that the message of Islam is truly conveyed. So now those are the rules of engagement. Those are the rules of engagement. And this brings us into the, the last issue is that this issue of you know, the concept of jihad and this, the whole you know, remembering 9-11 today. You know, again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best what exactly happened in 9-11. Was it Muslims that did it? Was it non-Muslims that did it? We don't know the, the reality behind this and Allah knows if we ever will find out. But let us just look at it from two scenarios. Scenario number one, that let's just say it was done by Muslims. Let us just say that this act of 9-11 was done by Muslims. They did it in the name of jihad, of trying to make the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala superior and make his deen superior. Did that act actually achieve their goal? Did Muslims become, you know, uh, did the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala become more respected and more loved and more accepted worldwide? The answer to that is no, it was actually counterproductive, right? So even the, 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 the message they may have been trying to get across, it was counterproductive, it actually made things much, much worse. So you lost the lives of 3,000 people, and then you make the lives of the Muslims living in North America, and even the worldwide, extremely difficult. Extremely, extremely difficult. If you look at all the protocols that are now being put in place, things like you know, the banning of religious symbols in Quebec that is happening right now. Things like you know, the type of sec immigra Im security immigration you have to go through in order to become a Canadian citizen. Like now it's like standard that before you become a Canadian citizen, you will go through a CSIS interview. So those of you that have become Canadian citizens within the last three years or so have had to go through this. But prior to 9-11, this was not the case. I want you to think about the type of humiliation and degradation an individual goes through when they go through airport security. Like there was once this concept of, you know, you would go to the airport like, 20 minutes before your flight, and you're catching your flight. Now you can sometimes go, especially if you're traveling to the States, go six hours before your flight, and you're not guaranteed to catch your flight. So they will ask you the stupid questions. They will physically humiliate you by patting you down. Like, you know, for those of you, I, I mean, just to speak generally over here, when you travel to the United States now, they actually have this list that has four S's on it. So you get your boarding pass, at the bottom it says observations, it'll have four S's on it. And this is, extra screening that you will have to go through. And in the world, if I'm not mistaken, according to Wikipedia at least, there's only 15,000 people that are on this list. And when you're on this list, not only do you have to go through that machine that scans your body, but after your whole body has been scanned and Allah knows best if they can physically see your body parts or not, but put that aside, you actually have to go through a physical pat down. And that means every single part of your body will physically be patted down. And you have no exception to this if you want to enter the, the country. Now if you look at this, this is one element of it. And then you look at the second element of it. That 9-11 was actually used as a basis for entering into Iraq. It was used as a basis for entering into Afghanistan. And even though they never found weapons of mass destruction, and obviously it was quite clear, they went for their own personal agendas of wanting oil, wanting gold, wanting money, you know, wanting to control the governments that were there, and a whole a wide variety of other issues those actions only became possible 
through 9-11. So 9-11 was the catalyst of all of this happening. So if it was done by Muslims, they definitely did not achieve their agenda. Now if it was done by non-Muslims, then again, this is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where we are required to be patient. And this does not change our rules of engagement. That just because, you know, you have uh, the American army in Afghanistan, you have them in Iraq, you have them in all sorts of other places, it doesn't mean that they, you start attacking civilians now. This is not what the Messenger of Allah وسلم, taught us. But even on the battlefield, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, teaches us that you don't attack women, you don't attack children, you don't attack priests and, uh, and rabbis, that you don't cut down trees, you don't burn down crops and vegetation. These are all ethics the Messenger of Allah وسلم, taught us in war. And that is why when you look at modern day warfare, there's no way it will ever be ethical. You know, one of the recent things that's coming up in the news now is now that, uh, you know, the accusation has been made against Bashar that he's been using chemical warfare. All of a sudden, Western governments now want to enter Syria. But what they fail to realize is that, I, you know, we feel the utmost uh, of condolences and sympathy towards the seven to 900 people that died in these chemical attacks. But what happened to the other 100,000 people that were killed through machine guns and uh, you know, being sniped and bombs and all this other stuff? Why is it that those lives were not respected? Right? So when it comes to modern day warfare, you'll see that the ethics of Islam are not into practice at all. As soon as you're using nuclear weapons and you're using chemical warfare, you will never have a fair battle. You will never have a fair battle. Now we can continue this discussion you know, on and off. But it shows you that if you look at the essence of Islam, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, has to be taught how to be staunch and severe against the kuffar. That this was not part of his nature. And even if you look at you know, the worst of the criminals, how does the Messenger of Allah وسلم, eventually deal with them in the opening of Mecca? That he enters into Mecca with his armor, with his shield, with his protection. He's ready to attack the Quraysh. He's taking them by surprise. If he wanted to kill all 10,000 of them, he could have done so easily. Or actually, there were more than 10,000. The Muslim army was 10,000. Though he could have done with the Quraysh as he pleased. But the Messenger of Allah وسلم, had a bigger purpose and a bigger goal behind it. And that was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be worshipped. So Islam does not condone you know, reckless killing and it is not there to in, in, entice fear into the hearts of people. But it is to bring the people from the darkness of worshipping other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into the light of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And this is why every single Muslim, regardless of what your role is in society, you can be someone who is a teacher, someone who is a taxi driver, someone who is maybe even a garbage man. Each and every one of us have a responsibility that living in the lands of non-Muslims, we have the responsibility of showing the best of akhlaq. Because the, this is the minimum amount of da'wah that you can do. Because I know the vast majority of us aren't presenting Islam by our tongues. We're not going out and actively you know, engaging with, with, with non-Muslims and presenting Islam to them. So the absolute minimum requirement is that at the very least, show the akhlaq of a good Muslim. That you know, someone gives you extra money, make sure you give them their change back. Someone does something kind for you, make sure you say thank you. You know, use terms like please, make sure you're smiling. These are just simple things that when they're added into your daily life, it has a huge impact. It has a huge impact. So these are just in summary some of my thoughts. I wanted to share more with you, but time flew by subhanAllah. And it's time for the uh, Adhan of Maghrib. But it's time that we start thinking about, you know, that message I mentioned in the beginning. And when I asked Dr. Bilal Phillips, you know, what was one thing that you would change before 9-11, before it happened, he said that I wish that Islam had a better picture in the media. I wish that Islam had a better picture in the media and that the image of Muslims was better. Now, 9-11 happened and all of that changed. And unfortunately, there's nothing that we can do to change that because the past is the past. But what we can control is the future. And it's up to us to think that, you know, what is the type of image we want to portray for Islam towards the non-Muslims? Do we constantly want to have this battle of where we fear Islamophobia, we fear the xenophobia, we fear, you know, all of these attacks and all of these conspiracies? Or do we actually want to play a positive role in giving back to the communities and societies that we belong to? And, you know, it's simple things that make a huge difference. I'll conclude with this. Um, you know, a couple, uh, um, a couple of months back, the MCC had organized uh, a blood drive. And this was something that I was thinking about from like my first day here at the ISC. Then I was like, at the ISC, we need to organize a blood drive. Because you give back to the community, you meet you know, other people that are in social work, they get exposed to Islam, it creates good conversation. And when, you're taking, when they're taking blood, you know, people, uh, you actually build, you know, start good conversations and stuff. 
And when I went for this, I actually was the first person there. They were supposed to show up at 12. I showed up at 10 because I was busy that day. And the, the lady that was doing the registration, and she's like, I've never met anyone by the name of Muhammad before. My first name is Muhammad. And I was like, really? And I'm like, do you know who Muhammad was? He was our prophet and this and that. And she's like, yeah, I've heard some stuff, but you know, I don't know if it's all good. And we struck up a conversation there. Then part two is that when they're actually draining the blood, I have like this fear of needles. And I don't know if you ever donated blood, but it's not an average needle, these small dinky needles. This needle is like this big. Like the actual needle part is that big. So they jam it into your arm <laughs> and you can't move your arm and you know, it's draining this blood out. And in your mind, you're like, what if they take too much blood and I die? You know, all these crazy thoughts are going through my mind. And the guy that's doing this, he's like, you know, I don't think I've met a Muslim before. You're the first Muslim I've ever met. And I'm like, really? He's like, yeah. And I thought to myself, SubhanAllah, imagine if this was the type of image that we portrayed as Muslims. It's just, just something small that our body needs to be the blood anyways. When you give hijama, hijama is, you know, taking out blood anyways. So here, if you can do hijama, at the very least, donate blood. You create a conversation, it creates a positive image for Islam. And you know this is something good to do. So on September 14th, they actually rescheduled my appointment again. They want you to donate blood every 56 days because there's like shortage of blood uh, in certain blood types and stuff. So I was thinking, you know what, for September 14th, why don't we organize a community blood drive? So obviously I'm not going to enforce this on you, but if anyone is interested in donating blood, I will be going on September 14th at 12 p.m. It's a Saturday and they're open all the way till 2 p.m. So if you can donate blood, you know, that's an ideal opportunity to go and check it out. Um, you don't get any money for it. You don't get anything like that. But they do give you cookies and juice and water and stuff. <laughs> and you get free parking. You don't have to pay for parking. And this is like your opportunity to, you know, give back to the communities that we live. Give the people that need blood. And, you know, you never know that one day you get into an accident and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends someone to give you blood because you did something else for mankind. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So I just wanted to use this surah, this opportunity as a point of reflection of you know, the, the meaning of 9-11 and how it affected Muslims and what our responsibility is towards our communities, towards our societies, and not just taking from our governments, but giving back to these communities and societies and being a positive image for the Muslims, for Islam, and most importantly, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.